Since 1961, about 400 humans have ventured into space. For the rest of the five billion of us back on Earth, we rely on the pictures and first-hand accounts of the astronauts to share their experience. The pictures have gotten clearer over the years, but the onset of high-definition technology opens a brand new window for the world to witness the wonders of space exploration. Now, for the first time ever, NASA's attempting the first live transmission from space in high definition. And Discovery is here to bring this exclusive event to you. Right now, the three-man crew on the International Space Station is preparing for this momentous occasion. So pull up a chair and get ready, as we now prepare to link up live with the space station in HD. We're here in Discovery's own state-of-the-art broadcast center, awaiting the first ever live downlink from space in high definition. Hello, I'm Robert Hager. The Space Station Project began in 1998. It's been manned continuously for the last five years. Construction is still underway, and it's scheduled to take another four years. Currently, on board the Space Station is an international crew of three. Tomas Reiter of the European Space Agency, Mikhail Turin of Russia, and Mike Lopez Alegria from NASA. Ryder will serve as our space cameraman today, and Lopez Alegria, or Mike, will be our host. But before we connect live to the astronauts on station, let's get a quick background update on ISS. Liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. With the shuttle program back to what NASA calls its normal operational tempo, Assembly of the International Space Station is now scheduled to be completed by 2010. Assembly of ISS began in 1998 when the first two modules were joined in orbit. And the station's been continuously manned since November of 2000. We've had crews permanently on board Space Station for about five years, and that's a different way of, of doing business. We're not just going into space temporarily, we're going into space to stay. A multinational effort, Space Station is the largest collaborative scientific project in history. The construction and operation of a permanently manned orbiting space station is seen by many as a critical leap forward in advancing space exploration. Assembled in orbit, ISS will eventually cover an area as large as a football field. Research in the station's labs has led to scientific breakthroughs that benefit all of humankind. One interesting thing we're doing on Space Station is we're looking at how drugs and, and vitamins are absorbed in zero-g and how that differs from the way they're absorbed on the ground. The Orbiting Science Laboratory also serves as a learning environment for future space travel. I think in a nutshell, without an ISS, we don't know the right questions to ask for long trips in space and in deep space. Now, while ISS is not deep space, it is a frontier where people can live in space long enough to ask the right questions, to collect the right data. We're doing that now. Currently living on board Space Station is the three-person Expedition 14 crew, representing Russia, Germany, and the USA. The crew will conduct many experiments relating to spacecraft systems, Earth observation, and human life science. As with the previous missions, this team's multiple month stay on station will also serve as a dress rehearsal for upcoming long duration spaceflight missions. I think the greatest thing ISS can do is really be that permanent beachhead in space that teaches us how to go beyond. It's, it's the Canary Islands to the Columbus trips and the Magellan trips. It's how do we react to space? What do we need to eat? How should we work? And so a space station is a right step. Living and working in space, the space station mission continues to help improve life here on Earth, as well as pave the way for journeys farther into the cosmos. Well, there's no doubt that going into space is risky and important work, but it must also be the experience of a lifetime for any brave astronaut who has the chance to go. Being able to share this experience with folks on Earth happens through pictures and personal accounts from the astronauts. The ability to show HD quality pictures from space brings this experience to an even higher level. 
And having a veteran shuttle astronaut like Pierre Thuot uh, to describe this experience is sort of the icing on the cake. Pierre, welcome. Thanks, Bob. Great to be here. Now, tell us about, uh, we're going to see these beautiful, clear pictures. What are you looking forward to in the next half hour here? Well, I'm sure many of the viewers have seen uh, HD professional football and the clarity and definition there. But heretofore, we've only seen standard definition images from space. So you don't get to see the, the clarity, the resolution of what's going on. And I think just like in a football game, there's a lot of action. There's going to be a lot of action today. And the floating, which is the most fun about being in space, you're going to get to see that in great definition. So the space station itself up there, 215 miles in space, what's the primary benefit of that for us, do you think? Well, I think the basic benefit is that it's a research laboratory. We can do things in space that we can't do here on the Earth. You can change pressure and temperature here on the Earth, but you can't change gravity. And so when we do experiments in space and alter gravity, we're able to find things out about materials and, and medicines and things like that we can't find out here on Earth. So hopefully, 24-7 laboratory, we'll be able to find some new drugs, some new materials and things that we can use here on Earth. Now, the long-range goal at the moment is to go on, try to go back to the moon, and then jump from there to Mars or even further out decades from now. But what, what can we learn uh, that would be valuable for that from the space station itself? Well, the crew spend about six months in space. And if you go to Mars, you're going to take a year, maybe a year and a half. So we need to really understand the, the human physiology, what happens when people are in zero gravity for that long a time, and also how they're going to be able to walk on Mars when they get there after they've been, say, a year in space. So they're doing lots of experiments on human physiology and trying to understand that. So when we do go to Mars, the astronauts will be able to function. Pierre, thanks very much. In anticipation of the big event, there's a quick intro to just how amazing pictures from space in high def can be. If you're afraid of heights, hold on. NASA's hoping the brilliant high definition TV images now being shot on board the International Space Station might make you feel as though you're actually there. Space is real, and we live in space. So capturing that through high definition brings us closer to being there. And that's an important element of space exploration. The human eye is a pretty amazing device, and it can see lots of fine detail and fine color structure. HD gets us closer to what you can see with your eye. One of NASA's main missions has always been to share information about space exploration with the public. From the first manned flights in 1961 to the present day, just over 400 people have been lucky enough to blast into orbit and see for themselves the spectacular panorama of space. The rest of us have had to rely on video technology, and this often made for some fuzzy viewing. Now with high definition TV, the days of grainy images transmitted from space are ancient history. The first HDTV camera that was flown in space was flown on STS-95. It was the John Glenn mission. And I do remember it very vividly. Everybody in the room, it was almost electric for them watching this video because all of us have been involved with NASA video for literally decades. And it was nothing that we had ever seen before. Uh, it was just incredible. But it's not just about pretty pictures for the viewing public. NASA hopes the sharper images will also help researchers on the ground learn more about our home planet. If you look at like a sunrise or a sunset and you can see how thin the atmosphere really is, you know, that little thin blue um, atmosphere is what keeps us uh, alive here on the Earth. I think you get an appreciation of how fragile our planet really is. For Earth sciences, it does a couple of things. It allows us to get a moving image uh, where they do an orbit of the Earth to get things in better perspective than you might get with still images. High definition TV can play an important role in understanding and documenting onboard experiments as well. It's accurate enough that we can actually use it for measurement purposes, which you can't do with analog video. There's too many inaccuracies in analog video. High definition TV has invaded the Earth, the space station, and beyond. We're now in the HD era here on Earth, television, movies, and all that. We are really also moving into the HD arena in space for the public. Not only at Mars, not only at Space Station, but also at the Moon. In 2008, we're launching the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which will carry a powerful set of imaging tools, which will produce basically HD imaging of the Moon at scales that we'll be able to see ourselves, the leftover hardware of Apollo. We're in an HD age, and it's going to the planets. 
So until the day comes when we can all take a rocket ride into orbit, sit back and enjoy the amazing HD TV views from above. And we think our signal is through now. It looks like the crew is ready. Commander Mike Lopez Alegria is standing by in the Destiny Laboratory aboard the International Space Station to bring us the first ever live downlink from space in HD. Mike, can you hear me out there? I hear you loud and clear, Robert. How do you hear me? Okay, I hear you very well, and we'll explain to our viewing audience that because the distance is involved here, they're 215 miles away, so there's just a little delay in the back and forth. Uh, Mike, uh, show us uh, what, what you can. You're in the Destiny Laboratory there, right? Can you take us on a little tour of, of what it looks like? You bet. Uh, this is actually the Unity node, which is uh, attached to the Destiny Laboratory. We'll be going there in just a second. But this is one of about six habitable volumes that we have on board the space station. Uh, my crew of three, uh, Thomas Ryder from the European Space Agency, who is behind the camera, so you can't see him, and Mikhail Turin, a cosmonaut from the Russian Space Agency. And I have been aboard uh, for, for about two months or so. Actually, Thomas has been here a bit longer. And uh, we basically spend uh, most of our time doing experiments, uh, operating, maintaining, and uh, constructing at sometimes this space station. So let me start with a little bit of a tour. As I said, this is a node. It has six different ports to which other modules can be attached. Uh, we also use it mostly for storage. Here you see a couple of spacesuits that we use for EVAs, extravehicular activities, or spacewalks. This is a Russian version on your left and a U.S. version on the right. And this is uh, what we affectionately call the water wall. There, is, uh, there are a whole bunch of these uh, con collapsible water containers behind them, which you see right here. Water, of course, is very precious to us, as it is to everybody on the ground. We use it not only for um, food and cooking, drinking, and hygiene, but we also use it to generate oxygen. So as you can see, it's sort of a very important consumable for us. And then above me, on what would be the ceiling, is our resistive exercise device, which is uh, also sort of like a universal weight machine. And we use this as one of our exercise tools to keep us uh, in good shape. I'll see if I can demonstrate here uh, one of the exercises we, we might want to do. Of course, the loss of bone and muscle density in space is a very important consideration. So we have a couple of countermeasures we use to uh, try to avoid that loss. See if I can do a couple bench press repetitions here. The resistance, of course, we can adjust with these um, cans, which basically it's just a great big rubber band that uh, keeps the resistance wherever we need it. Actually very effective. Okay, we're going to head uh, forward now from the Unity into the laboratory module. As you mentioned, the lab module is called Destiny. And this is where we do the bulk of our work here uh, on the U.S. segment. We have a number of experiments that are going on in here all the time. Um, we do some operations from here and uh, we actually, I actually live here right now. Um, Tomas and Misha live in the um, Russian segment in the service module. First stop here is our uh, robotic workstation. We use this to control the space station's robotic manipulator system, otherwise known as the robot arm. Uh, you can see a couple of hand controllers, some monitors that we use to uh, view our work as it's going on. Continuing forward, you see we have a lot of these laptops deployed. We actually control the station largely through laptops uh, when we do it on board, although our team in Mission Control in Houston does most of that commanding. Uh, here are a couple of experiments. Um, one in particular is pretty interesting, this European uh, delivered MELFI, which stands for minus 80 degree laboratory freezer. It's in fact closer to minus 100 degrees right now, and I thought I might show you where we like to keep our ice cream if we had any on board. Mike, that's a new piece of equipment up there, right? Mike, that's a new piece of equipment up there, right? Yes, Melfi came up um, about two shuttle flights ago, and we're already using it to store samples of um, blood and urine that we're collecting for some experiments as well as some others. I'll give you a peek inside here. In case you can't tell on high definition, which I'm sure you can, it's quite cold. 
How cold again was it, Mike? In fact, it's frozen, it appears. <laughs> it's uh, about a minus 100 degrees centigrade. So it's quite cold. Yeah, I would not want to go out in that. But, but the fact that you got that, that freezer up there now enables you to uh, store samples uh, of your own blood uh, for, uh, for blood checks later, right? For determining bodily changes uh, as you stay on the space station over a longer time? Right. One of the things that we're very interested in, of course, is what happens to the human body as uh, we are subjected to long periods of uh, microgravity. And we can measure um, what we intake by um, basically notating everything that we eat or drink in a certain period. And then our blood samples correlate how our body is processing those. And of course, uh, the blood samples we can't analyze on board, so we freeze them for later uh, analysis on the ground. How about the rest of the experiments? How about the rest of the experiments? Okay, uh, right above me now is the European Modular Cultivation System. It's basically a couple of large centrifuge tables uh, which can hold some biological samples, either plants or uh, other tissues that uh, we can vary the effects of gravity by spinning them at various rates. There's all kinds of uh, photographic and other recording equipment inside that can monitor what's going on with those samples as we use them. Uh, immediately to your left is uh, one of our two human research facility racks. There's uh, equipment to measure gas intake. We use that a lot when we're doing exercise to try to understand how our bodies are processing, uh, metabolizing oxygen, especially on board. I'm passing over one of our favorite spots in the laboratory, which is the uh, window, which <laughs> looks down over the earth. We'll probably take a look at that a bit later. Oh, you bet. We're planning on, on that. Uh, you are left. Again, is the is the CVIS, the uh, Cycle Ergometer Vibration Isolation System. You see, it appears to be floating. It's actually on a series of uh, well vibration isolators, so that our loads that we put in when we're pedaling don't get transmitted to the structure and disturb the microgravity environment aboard the station. On the left, uh, uh, excuse me, on your right behind that other laptop is a uh, microgravity science glove box that we can use. Uh, you, we would put our arms inside uh, those two, well, you can only see one of them, green circles there to be able to work in an environment that might be hazardous to us or uh, in other way, other way want to be protected from aboard. Uh, this is a very forward most part of the node. All this gear that you see here is stuff that has been pre-packed. It will be going home on the shuttle discovery, which uh, we expect in early December. And a couple of more experiments. This is called Altea, the uh, anomalous long-term effects on astronauts. This is basically a measurement tool to measure, uh, I'll just call them cosmic rays, that we take on board. We actually put uh, this uh, EEG cap on and put our head inside this device and we can correlate actually there's some visual uh, disturbances that occur and we can correlate when they occur to when this the sensitive um, sensors can measure impacts from cosmic energy. Uh, lastly this experiment is called spheres synchronized position hold uh, let's see if I can get the rest of the acronym. I can't. Anyway, it is uh, pretty neat. It's a satellite system. We have a couple of them, actually, and uh, is one of our, in fact, I think it's the only DOD experiment we have aboard, but it uses uh, CO2 gas to maneuver itself, and we can actually get these two um, f satellites to fly in formation with each other and actually dock to each other. So that's a pretty fun experiment. We got to do that a little bit last weekend. Yeah, and I think I see the idea um, there so that you couldn't do that. Anyway, that's kind of a very rough overview. Couldn't do it on Earth where, where there's gravity. You need to get, be in space. Are we able to uh, move over to the window? Are you? Uh, can Thomas move the camera over there and show us the view out? Can Thomas move the camera over there and show us the view out? Sure, you bet. He's uh, showing you our laptop right now, which shows you where we are. Obviously, we are just crossed over uh, the east coast, sorry, the west coast of Africa after um, having passed through the North Atlantic. And uh, he will now take the camera down into the uh, 
lab window and show you exactly where, what it looks like from here. The um, terrain below, how would I say it? It's, it is an experience that makes you really appreciate what we have down there, that it's fragile, that we need to protect it. And uh, you feel very detached from it and sort of you miss it. It's, it's your home. It's uh, where all your loved ones are, where all of your experiences have happened. And you really get a sense of being separated from it in a way. And I think in terms of, uh, of the imagery and experiments, people sometimes wonder, I mean, we have uh, unmanned satellites that circle the Earth and take this kind of photography, but there's some advantage, too, to what you can do, right, with a, a human looking out there to where, to where to focus in, where to take the shots? Looking out there to where to focus in, where to take the shots? Well, certainly the advantage uh, that humans have over robots is that we can adapt quickly. We can, uh, you know, respond to changing situations. Uh, for instance, my predecessor as science officer aboard uh, on Expedition 13, Jeff Williams, managed to take a picture of a volcano that was erupting in the uh, Aleutian Island chain. And even if they wanted to program a satellite to take a picture of it, nobody could know when it was going to happen or, or when the satellite would be there. It would take a while to get there. Uh, it was a very short eruption, and he managed to take a, a shot of it. So, uh, yes, we do have the ability to respond in more real time. And I think we also have a different sense of, you know, art in a way. We can take pictures that a satellite might not want to take because uh, from a science standpoint, it might not be all that interesting, but we're all, we are all uh, humans after all, and, and the pictures actually appeal to a different sense Mike, than just the science. Mike, let's go to the food now. Uh, I think this is the fun stuff for viewers, I think. Can you show us uh, how you manage up there? I mean, I, I can only imagine that it's, it's very, very difficult in space where juices and things like that uh, want to float all over the cabin, crumbs. But how do you deal? Just give us a little lesson in it. Well, you're right. I mean, it's different. It's, uh, some of it's uh, challenging. Some of it's fun. I, I've prepared a couple of uh, items for your consideration. <laughs> First of all, our, su our food comes in a variety of different forms. Some of it is dehydrated and some of it is uh, thermal stabilized. Some of it comes in its natural form. This is soup before it's dehydrated. It doesn't look particularly appetizing. And this is soup. It's uh, noodle soup with meat after it's been hydrated. It looks a little bit better. Um, you can choose to eat this soup with a spoon if you'd like, but it's more practical just to use this sort of built-in straw device. You know, that all looks so difficult, and I know studies have shown that eating is very psychologically important uh, for, for crews on space stations where they're away from the Earth for a long time. Uh, are you able to get some pleasure out of eating, even though it's, it's a lot more difficult than on Earth? Absolutely. Well, first of all, you're right. Eating is extremely important, and it's uh, the folks at NASA and the Russian Space Agency go to great lengths to try to, you know, accommodate our tastes and our uh, what we think we're going to like on orbit. Of course, people's tastes tend to change. We tend to like things that are a bit more spicy. Um, you can imagine that salt and pepper don't work so well up here, so we actually have our salt, pepper, soy sauce, and actually some wasabi in a different sort of a form. This is actually salt, and in order to apply it, you just remove the lid and squirt some. You can see some of it is caked on the outside, but you just sort of squirt some onto uh, whatever yeah, your food is. I got the idea is. there. If you, if you were shaking um, it like a course, salt and pepper and shaker, go all over the, yeah, all over the laboratory, right? Like the crumbs, and the, the, the salt and the pepper. Right? Yeah. The it, the yes, the salt, the salt granules would definitely be problematic. Of course, these uh, candy-coated almonds are a real treat. Um, they taste about the same, but they're obviously a lot more fun. If you'd like, you could perhaps try one. <laughs> in high definition, that's something coming at us like that. <laughs> in high definition, that's something coming at us like that. And then drinking, of course, this is um, what tea might look like, or what it does look like, before it's been hydrated. This is tea with sugar, so you can see the tea bag inside, along with the sugar. And then once you hydrate it, we put about um, 200 milliliters or so of water in there, and it actually tastes quite good. 
Uh, same idea in this. This is orange pineapple drink, and of course, you got to be careful. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't do the obligatory orange bubble trick. Nice. Nice. Fluids in space uh, end up taking the form of spheres to reduce the, uh, or due to surface tension. And um, you can sort of play with it as much as you want. You can blow on it to get it to do certain things. Um, but the best thing to do with it is <laughs> to eat it or drink it. Um, so simple, that looks great. <laughs> we have some. So simple, that looks great. <laughs> We have some fajitas on board that we could use. These are actually, obviously, in its natural form, tortillas. So we would just take the tortillas and then uh, take the fajitas, which I'll show you a shot of inside. Pretty, pretty appetizing. We have chicken fajitas, beef fajitas. Uh, there are probably over 200 different menu selection items, and we build our own menus. Um, we eat each other's food. This one has a red dot on it. That means it's mine, but it doesn't matter. We eat each other's food, and uh, we build a menu that supposedly goes by days. So you're but living pretty well up there. basically, it's time to eat, you just look in the pantry, take out what looks pretty good, well and eat it. We do okay up here. Mike, I think we're out of time, but uh, I want to thank you a whole lot for taking time out of your incredibly busy work schedule uh, to share a very special technology first with our viewers, seeing you live in HD TV. I mean, seeing the pictures from here on Earth, it's, it's really like being there. So thanks a lot, Mike. Robert, it is uh, our pleasure, the Expedition 14 crew of the International Space Station Alpha, as well as the NASA team, to participate in this first ever HTTV event. Uh, we had a great time showing you kind of what it is that we do up here day to day, and we look forward to more of the same in the future. Great, Mike, that was just a lot Thank of fun. Thank you and good day. Good day to you. Great, Mike. You know, I've been covering the space program for many years, and I've seen the evolution of these live images coming back from space since the days of the Apollo missions. And I gotta say, this is truly amazing. So thanks everyone for watching. This has been a live broadcast special of Discovery HD Theater on momentous technology first. The first live broadcast from the International Space Station in high definition. This is Robert Hager, so long from Discovery.